let's go back to our ancestors for a moment. Um, <clears throat> what apparatus was at their disposal subconsciously or consciously to help them understand and prioritize calorically dense food? Because I got to believe that the three things that mattered most, correct me if I'm wrong, would be total calories, protein, and sodium. I mean, it can't be an accident that sodium is the only mineral we can taste, right? Yeah, correct. So, um, or I should say, by correct, I mean, that is how I think about it as well. Um, and to break down the energy piece that would come for, for an animal with a digestive tract like a human, that would come primarily from carbohydrate and fat. So we have carbohydrate, fat, protein, uh, salt, and then... Sometimes I add glutamate, umami to that list as well. And essentially... And this is subconscious, Stefan? Like, were we... Or is this, again, just part of that stuff that was now so wired into us that... Yes. You know, we didn't want to eat grass. Like, we knew that even though you could sort of get the gastric distension from eating a lot of grass, like a cow could, it was doing nothing for us. Both, it didn't taste good. And so in the short term, it wasn't pleasing. And in the long term, obviously, it didn't satiate us. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, there's a couple of angles on this. One, obviously, humans have cultures. So we figured out, you know, what foods are good over long periods of time. But a key aspect of this is dopamine mediated reinforcement. And essentially, our bodies are set up to respond to certain types of nutrients, like the ones you mentioned. And create a motivation and learning response that prioritizes and sets the motivational level on the seeking of those types of foods. And so presumably these are the kinds of nutrients that um, our ancestors would have needed to prioritize to maximize their reproductive success, the currency of natural selection. So essentially, we have these motivational systems that were selected to seek certain types of nutrients in the environment. And if you look at the, the modeling that's been done on foraging behavior in a wide variety of animals and in humans, you see that it revolves around maximizing the energy return rate of foraging. This doesn't describe every species, but it does describe many species. It's amazing to watch it in big cats, for example, where they'll be chasing an antelope. And it's literally almost like they have a sensor inside that says, I'm going to stop chasing now because my energy cost is not going to be met by my consumption over this period of time. Absolutely. And these animals, you know, they don't know how to do math. They don't know that they're actually implementing a mathematical equation in their head, but yeah. they are. It's just wired into their brains the same way it's wired into us. You can predict hunter-gatherer foraging behavior to a, surprisingly, um, to a surprising degree just by knowing the calorie return rate of different foraging options. So our brains are very much wired, not just our brains, but our bodies are very much wired around energy acquisition in terms of how our motivation and learning is set up on a non-conscious level. And um, this is very much hardwired. So we have dedicated sensors in the digestive tract. This, this is all pretty recent research since 2018. Um, they discovered these cells that they named neuropod cells in the small intestine primarily that have um, receptors for specific nutrients that are directly, these cells are directly hooked up to vagal neurons. So when they detect glucose or amino acids, fatty acids, so that would be carbohydrate, fat, protein, they get the concentration and they start sending signals up your vagus nerve, up to your brainstem. And from there, it gets distributed to many parts of your brain. But um, particularly relevant part is the parts of your brain that uh, have to do with dopamine release onto your reward centers. And if the food that you're eating contains a high concentration of these valuable nutrients, particularly in combination with one another, you're going to get a higher level of dopamine release. The more dopamine release you get, the more of a motivation you will develop toward that food. 
why is it there there are and maybe this is just me i don't know what the literature would say so th this this could be incorrect but in me <clears throat> like a ribeye is not something i seem to be able to eat into excess and i feel like i should like shouldn't i be wired to eat ribeye until i can't stand like shouldn't i be wired to eat ribeye until the point of vomiting given how high it is in sodium, fat, and protein, and total calories. Like the only thing it's missing is sugar and and fiber and, you know, carbohydrates and things like that. But but it's easier for me to overeat baked potatoes than it is to overeat a ribeye. Um, and I'm not sure I understand why. So let me let me just clarify. With with a potato, is that with or without toppings? With, let's say with. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So no, let's let's okay. put on let's put on butter, uh, sour cream, and salt. So so I'm clearly making it much more than the carb, of course. Got it. Um, and it has to be crispy skin too. Like if I'm gonna do it right, <laughs> you know, I can't be like some lame ass buffet baked potato. It's got to be my style. Um, yeah, but, that's an. In but I don't know why I, I I don't know why like a fatty piece of meat is not something I have an amazing is that is my experience typical or would most people be able to just eat ribeyes until they puke? Oh, that's a good question. I I really don't know. I will say that when you look at um, the foods that people cite as the most um, typically associated with strong cravings and loss of control over eating behavior meat does not usually come up high on that list. And so... Which seems like it should, right? Yeah, I mean, I can only speculate about that. Um, I'm not really sure why... I can understand where you're coming from. I don't know whether that's a kind of generalizable phenomenon. Um, I can only speculate about why that might be. So there are a couple of things that come to mind for me. The first is that meat is about... 75 percent water so the calorie density of is actually it's not low but it's not especially high unless you're eating a really fatty piece of meat so that's one thing if we're comparing it to something like a brownie or uh something like pizza which is more calorie dense than Got the it. steak okay. um the second thing is it doesn't have any carbohydrates so it doesn't have that fat carbohydrate combination that is most closely associated with foods that people lose control around. The third thing I would cite is the high protein level. So even though we have this strong protein specific appetite that's been demonstrated in many different species, protein doesn't work the same as carbohydrate and fat. And I think, I think we, we recognize that that's the case. Protein seems to, it's something that our bodies really want to get enough of, but don't want to get too much of. So there's really a, not only there's a drive to acquire it, but there's a drive to keep it within a certain range and not eat too much. And we see that, you know, if people go on high protein diets, their overall calorie intake will drop. <laughs> 